In this lesson, we'll dig into pin configuration using STM32Cube IDE. I'll start by discussing pin naming and numbering. This is fairly simple, but you need to understand it before going further. Next, we'll look at the pin mapping table that exists in the MCU datasheet. This table is programmed into the IDE, so you really don't need to use the table, but I think it is good to see where the IDE gets its information. Finally, we'll try out some pin and peripheral configurations using the IDE to see how it works. Now, one note on terminology. When we looked at MCU architecture, we talked about peripheral signals. They get mapped to pins, and we called them I.O. signals. In the pin mapping documentation, they are instead called pin functions. For example, a pin could have a function of USART1TX, which means it is mapped to the USART1 peripheral and the TX signal. This is pretty obvious, I think, but I want to make it clear. First, let's talk about pin names and pin numbers. It's not difficult, but can get confusing. I'll try to explain it, and then we'll look at an example. So there are logical pin names and physical pin names. Logical pin names are used most often, especially for people working on software. Physical pin names tend to be used when you're working with hardware. In STM32, a logical pin name contains a port name and a number. So what is a port? Well, don't read too much into it. It's really just a collection of pins. Port names are identified with letters. So we have PA, PB, PC for port A, port B, and port C. Within a port, the pins are identified by number 015. So port C, pin 7, would be referred to as pin PC7. So that's logical pin names. Now for physical pin names. Physical pin names depend on the package. Each package type has physical pin names based on where the pin is located on the part. The name might just be a number or a letter in a number. The pin grid array package uses a letter and a number. For each package type, for a particular MCU, there is a mapping between the logical pin names and the physical pin names. It makes sense, I hope. Now, because different packages have different numbers of pins, there are some logical pins that only exist on some packages and we'll see uh, examples of that. Now here is the MCU we are using for this course, and this diagram shows the relationship between logical pin names and physical pin names. So the physical pin names are these numbers that go around the uh, chip, you know, from 1 to 64. It, it's a 64-pin uh, package. And the logical pin names are written on these these tabs here and you can see you know here is port C pin 2 the one thing you might notice is that the logical pin names aren't in a 100% logical placement on the part you'll see that here are some port A uh, pins here are some port C starting with pin 4 and uh, here are some other port C pins and some other port A pins. They're not random, but you have to look to find them. So if we looked at another package type, physically it would not be the uh, same as this because uh, maybe the pins would be in a grid on the package, for example. And the mapping between the physical pin numbers and the uh, logical pins would also be completely different. Now let's look at the pin mapping tables in the MCU datasheet. You may remember we looked at this datasheet in the previous lesson on documentation structure. 
So first I want to look at the mapping between logical pin names and physical pin names. There is a table 8, which is on page 38, which has that information. Here is table 8, and I'll scroll down a little bit. This table goes on for many pages. It's quite long. And each row in this table is for a particular um, logical pin name. And one of the things it shows you is the physical pin name associated with that logical uh, pin. So in this case, in the first row, logical pin PE2 corresponds to physical pin 1 or physical pin B2 on these two packages. These packages have no mapping, so the logical uh, pin PE2 isn't uh, available on those packages. And you can see um, that's the case for most of these port, or all of these port E um, logical pins. Now, when you get down to port C, th pin 13, there is a mapping for all of the packages. The other thing this table does is show which functions each logical pin can do. In other, in other words, what pin assignments are possible. So if we pick PE5, we can see some of the things it can be assigned to are a SPI uh, signal or a timer signal. Now, for this pin assignment um, information, there is a, another table that I think shows it better. It's table 9, and it happens to be on page 45. This table is organized as a grid, where each logical pin is a row in the grid, and each column is one or more peripherals. So this is timers 3, 4, and 5. The cells in the grid show which peripheral I.O. signals or functions can be assigned to the logical pin. So let's take a look at this first row in the table for PA0. It can be used for four different peripheral I.O. signals or functions. Uh, these these uh, signals for timer 2, timer 5, and USART 2. And for timer 2 there were two different signals it could be mapped to. Now you'll see event out for every uh, logical pin. This function has a very specialized use for multi-core processors, so I won't discuss it any further. If you're interested, uh, look at the ARM Architectural Reference Manual for the instruction SEV, and that'll tell you what this is all about. You might notice that GPIO is not mentioned in this table. That is because any programmable pin can be a GPIO, so they don't really need to show that. We can also look at columns in the grid to see which pin we can use for a particular function. For example, let's find out which pins can be used for the UART1 TX signal. Now that is, here is the uh, column that contains UART1. So we're just going to scan down and look for UART1 underscore TX. And uh, here's one of them, pin PA9. And if I keep going, here's another UART1 TX, uh, PB6. And I can tell you, I've been through this, those are the only two pins uh, for that function. I also want to look at uh, PB2 right here. You'll notice it can't, there's no functions it can be used for except for event out. So what is this pin used for? Well, it would have to be GPIO. That's the only, only, only use of it. So we could use these tables to sort of work out our pin assignments, but it is a lot easier to let the IDE help us. So let's go there. So here we are in the IDE uh, device configuration perspective. Now this is a default pin connect 
uh, configuration for our MCU. And it is based on the fact that we told the IDE we have a nucleo board. So it knows we have a crystal, an LED, a push button, a serial link, and a debug interface. It has configured the peripherals as well as the pins based on this information. Now notice if we look at the peripherals now, and I'm going to look at some of these connectivity ones, we find that I2C2 and SPI1 are blocked out uh, with this red indicator. It means that we can't use these. So why is this? Well, if we looked at I2C, uh, I2C2 in that pin uh, mapping grid, we would find that it needs PB3 and PB10, and there are no other choices in that case. But PB3 is used and uh, pinned, so it's not available, and thus I2C2 can't be used. There's a similar situation with SPI1. In that case, there are two pin choices for its signals, but both are blocked. One choice is blocked uh, by PB3, and the other is blocked by PA5, uh, which is connected to a green LED. So both I2C2 and SPI1 are being affected by this PB3 pin. And normally that would be fine. It's just a limitation of the MCU pin mapping. And if we needed an I2C uh, or an SPI bus interface, we would try one of the others and maybe we could do the uh, pin mapping. But this is an odd case, which is indicated by uh, this pin being yellow. So let me explain. We can check what PB3 is assigned to by clicking on it like this. And what this tells us is that it's assigned to a debug feature that allows your code to write messages to the debug interface. I won't go into this now, but if we look at the system configuration, which I can do this way and open this up, here is the debug mode. And this debug mode is inconsistent with this pin assignment. And in particular, that pin assignment is for this debug mode. So if I enable that debug mode, now it goes green and, and uh, there's consistency. Of course, these, these peripherals over here are still blocked because they need that pin. And the thing is, I don't want that debug mode. I want uh, serial wire. And so what I can do is I can unassign, put this in the reset state, which is basically unassigning the pin. So the yellow goes away, the pin is now unassigned, and interestingly, these, uh, the, the red indicators went away because now we could make use of these uh, peripherals. I'm going to leave this uh, like this. I don't know why that pin was assigned in, the, in that way. Uh, it, to me, it seems like it's a bug in the uh, default configuration for the Nucleo board, but maybe there's some reason they did that. Now I want to look at one more thing, these timers. And you'll notice that several of these timers have a yellow triangle. And let's click on one. And what this shows us is the timer uh, says it can't um, assign channel 4. These channels are output signals uh, from the timer. And if we were to look on that uh, pin assignment grid, we would find out that channel 4 has only one possible output, and that is PA3, which is this here. And of course, it's already in use. So what this uh, is telling us is that you can use the timer, you just can't um, have channel 4 as an output. And that might be perfectly fine the way you're using this uh, timer. These other timers have similar issues to this. Again, they can be used, but they don't have full functionality. So I'm going to close this, and I hope this um, gives you sort of an idea of, of how pin conflicts occur why they occur, 
and a little bit on how you can um, resolve them. Now let's try to enable another peripheral and check out pin assignment. Say we want to use UR1. We select that, we open the parameters, and we set the mode from disable to asynchronous. These other parameters we'll just leave with the defaults. And if you noticed, it, you, it has selected PA9 and PA10 for those USART uh, signals. So now I'm going to temporarily disable it, and I'm going to set PA9 to be a GPIO, GPIO output. So it can't use that. Now let's try to re-enable it and see what happens. And if you'll notice, it's still using PA10, but it has went to PB6 for the TX signal. So it's found an alternate uh, pin and selected that. That's great. Now we're going to make life a little harder. We're going to disable that, and we're going to make PB6 a GPIO output. Now, what has happened is uh, USART1 now has that red symbol. The mode is red, basically saying UART1 can no longer be used. And that's fair enough. We, it has no choice. There are no pins available. So let me put these back uh, and get things back to way that, where they were. And, and so we, we're now back to uh, no UART1. So I hope this gives you an idea of how peripheral selection and pin assignment works. You can imagine that with a large project, an engineer might spend a lot of time with this tool. They would need to be very certain that everything is good before committing to an MCU part and before they do the board design. Now one final note, when the MCU powers up, before your software starts running, there is no pin config set up. The MCU doesn't know whether the pins are inputs or outputs, and so the pins are initially put in a sort of passive mode. It is only when your software configures the pins that they begin operating normally. In some cases, uh, hardware designers have to include circuitry to ensure that the output signals are stable during this power-up period. So that's, that's it for pin configuration, and thanks for watching.